Good afternoon. How's that? Better. Okay. So, this morning, this morning, Father Greg apologized for using a four-letter word. Some of you were here. All of you were here. You heard him apologize for his four-letter word. There's a word that is worse than that. There's another four-letter word, and that four-letter word is loss. L O S S. And that, is, that word is an equal opportunity offender. It affects all of us. None of us get to go through life without having that kind of experience. Our panel today are what we would call, um, in the world I come from, loss managers. This means that not only have they experienced loss, in very significant categories, especially um, if you, as you read their compelling stories in the, in the program. But they've become stronger for the experience. They are what we call loss managers. They are actually, I would call them poster children for being loss managers. And I, I hope by now you've read their stories in the program. But what we're going to do here is we're going to ask each of them to introduce themselves and talk with you for about 10 minutes about what their experience was like as children growing up with relatives, growing up in foster care, and how they used that experience to become so strong that they're able to help others. And so we're going to do that, each of them taking 10. Then we're going to have a dialogue among ourselves so that they can talk with each other. And then we're going to have a dialogue among ourselves so that you have a chance also to ask them, like, how did you manage that? Because it is our hope and our aim that when we walk out of here, we can use these lessons to go and help other people as well. All of us have to be loss managers. So we are going to start um, right here close to home and did we agree that we're going to start with our colleague? And um, you experienced foster care here in Los Angeles County, yes? So introduce yourself to the group and tell us um, what, what you took away from that experience and how you've used that to help others. Say your name. Good afternoon. Um, I am Nelijah Bush. And I grew up in the Los Angeles Department of Foster Care uh, from the age of six. Um, before that, there were a few homes, but I was returned home. Uh, six years old, I never returned home. I grew up in the same foster home with my sibling, uh, one sister. So um, with that, of course, I used that foundation to figure out that I wanted to become a social worker so that I can work with foster youth um, who are removed from their homes. A lot of times, oftentimes, we forget that when we remove children, our goal is, of course, to make sure they're safe. However, we forget to explain to them or to have a conversation with them on why they're being removed and what their next step is. So in, in going through the system, you, you're just put into a new home and you have to adjust and move forward and, and, and not have many of your questions answered or not knowing where to go to find this information. Although a social worker is coming out to see you on a regular base, um, they're just making sure you're safe and not concerned whether how you're doing in the home or what is taking place. And as a foster youth, you know, you're, you're afraid to say what may be taking place because you don't want to disrupt uh, whatever stability you have established. So growing up with my sister and having that, uh, having her be a part of my life is important and oftentimes we, it's easier to, if, if, if it makes it easier for me to separate the siblings or to not have the siblings together because it's a large sibling group, um, I just, you know, taking that away, we need to understand how important it is to try our best to keep our siblings together. And if they're not together, how important it is to uh, make sure that they're having their visits. Um, at one point, um, I remember my sister just being concerned because when we were detained, she was the one where the main part of the abuse took place to, and I was at school. 
So, of course, her next question was, where's my sister? So we need to um, just consider that because being a, um, a, a, big, a big sister and knowing that my little sister was in danger is, is uh, a part of knowing that siblings have to be together and stay together. So this is a part of um, my foundation in becoming a social worker. I'm going to ask you one, one question. We have a few more minutes before we move on. Um, my, I'm a foster parent, and my foster daughter came after she and her sister were separated. And uh, they kept, the family kept the little one and told the big one that she couldn't stay and told the little one the big one had died. And that was their experience. It took us 40 years to reunite those. As you look at our colleagues here, what is one piece of advice that you could give us so that we could do everything that we could to fight for keeping siblings together. Because sometimes parents will say, I can do this one, but not that one, or I don't have the space, or whatever. Each of us have to be advocates. What's one thing that we could do just to fight for these kids being together? One piece of advice. Try your best to maintain that sibling connection, no, no matter how, via telephone, via visits, even um, if, if you yourself have to figure out a way to connect the child to just have their visits um, where you're picking them up at least once a month, just to try your best to maintain that connection. So in other words, what you're saying is that even if we can't have in person, we could even just by phone or some other way that we have to be able to advocate for that. Because after all, we're going to know our siblings a lot longer than we're going to know our parents. Right? Absolutely. That's true. So thank you for inspiring us with that. We're going to come back to you in a little bit. So we're going to come on over to um, your colleague next to you, who also um, grew up in L.A. County, but you grew up with, uh, with a relative. Is that right? Okay, so tell us about your story. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Rudy Ed Castro. Um, I'm a social worker. Uh, I, I, I first want to thank everyone for being here. Uh, you, you, uh, I, I'm, I'm pretty emotional right now because it's, it's amazing how many people out there really care about, about people who don't or kids, especially do not have, have the love and support that they deserve. Um, and I, am, I was one of them. And um, I'll tell my story a little bit. Um, but I was just sitting here thinking about how beautiful it is that, that, that there are a lot of support systems out there. And it's just about being able to tap into them. I missed Father Greg this morning. I was working and I got here before the panel. But I always love hearing him because every time I do, I cry. I cry every time because he works with uh, the population of, of who, I, who I am, who I come from, what I am. Um, so every time I hear him, it just hits a part of me that just brings me to tears. I grew up uh, in a family of uh, three generations of gang members and uh, in East L.A., grew up on welfare, uh, grew up with both parents as addicts. My mom and dad separated at age five. Um, did not see my dad maybe a handful of times after that, pretty much throughout my life. He's still out there struggling with alcohol. I reunited with him not too long ago, and I forgave him. I had an amazing experience with him, a healing experience, which is really my message about healing. It's about what I've, what I've come to learn is that through my adult experience, has been a, healing a lot of my childhood stuff that has, has allowed me to be more of service to others. Um, my mom, uh, this is what's interesting about today. In five days, my, it'll be my, the anniversary of my, of my mom's death. She died from a, a result of, uh, of addiction, of an overdose, uh, about, I think it's nine years ago now. Um, that shaped that shaped the decision of going to school as well to, to get my master's in social work. Um, so, you know, at the time of year for me, that brings up a lot of emotion. It's the beginning of the holidays. It's not really the best of times for me. But what I've, what I've learned how to do is turn that around and learn how to, how to create uh, some new experiences for myself. Um, and that's been a, a huge blessing for me. Uh, what part of my story is that my grandmother raised me. So my grandmother took took me and my brother and my sister in. I'm the oldest of three, and after my mom pretty much bounced in and out of prison because during the during the 80s is when she when when I was taking care of my grandmother. It's during the time where they didn't really deal with addiction by sending them to treatment, they pretty much just sent them to jail, 
And my mom has a lo had a long history of going in and out of jail because she was a heroin addict and she did a lot of things to get money for her drugs. Um, the last time she actually went to jail was a long period of time, seven years. She got out and she went to her first treatment. And I got to have an experience with her for a year that was like no, like no other experience I had. She was sober. And it was a beautiful moment that I had. And then about a year after that, she relapsed. And then um, she eventually you know, passed away as a result of drug addiction. But you know, to me, that was a, an example of why we continuously improve the, the, the structures of, of support services out there. Because with, with the ability of having treatment, she was able to get sober. And if she would have been able to try to do that earlier in her life, maybe she would have had a, a, you know, an opportunity to stay clean and sober. Um, but my grandmother, I want to talk about her a little bit because I also, my grandmother raised me and then the system raised me. And um, my grandmother raised me up until the age of 15. And it took me until after she died, which is just over a, a year and a half ago, to really appreciate her. Um, I would, I guess I put a lot of blame on, not on her, but just like why she didn't do, she could not be who I really needed, a mother and a father, or what I thought I needed. But she raised three kids after raising her own five kids. Um, so I just want to give a, an acknowledgement to her and acknowledgement to the people that probably work with, you know, grandparents and um, other other relatives that take care of children. Uh, I could cry about this now because my grandmother, with, despite her flaws, she was an amazing person. She raised me when nobody else was there. The bottom line kept me from going to the system. And, uh, wow. Um, and I can't say that to her face. I mean, I, I did thank her for a lot. But what I do want to say is that I actually got a chance to take care of her at the end of her life. Um, she was in my home, and I took care of her. And uh, I was in the sandwich generation. I had my own child to take care of and my grandmother to take care of. And it was really difficult while going to school, getting my master's at the same time. Um, and my grandmother died at, at, before I graduated, and she wasn't able to uh, see that. Uh, but I got, to, I got to do what she did for me, take care, take care of each other. Uh, I'm emotional about it because, like I said, it took me until after her death to realize like, really what she meant to me. Because um, I would complain to her, <laughs> you know, I would complain like as I'm taking care of her and say, why, why not this and why not that, you know, but she wasn't responsible for a lot of the whys, you know, or the what's or, you know, the how's. And so I, I, uh, I've forgiven myself for it, but I definitely want to acknowledge her because she, you know, as my, my own family's growing, um, I'm expecting another child and I, you know, I have a growing family and I'm realizing like, wow, my grandmother took care of three of us, you know, I mean, she was, we were on welfare and she, she raises the best she could on, under, you know, the limitations that she had, but she was present, you know, she might not have had the emotional connection that I, that I needed, but she took care of me physically. Um, and it was family more than, than, you know, maybe a system could have done for me. Um, what, what didn't, what happened was that I could not, she could not maintain me anymore. And I, and I was involved in the streets and uh, involved in trouble, and I eventually got arrested and was sent to a juvenile boys' home. So I think when it was asked, does anybody work in probation? Does anybody work in probation here? Okay. Um, I, it, it, so I, didn't be, I became a, a product of the, of the system in, in terms of I was under the county of probation as a juvenile. Um, however, my, my grandmother gave up her, her, uh, um, her whatever the word is, her ability to take care of me, and I was a ward of the, ward of the state, really, for the, for, from 15 to 18. And I was given a support system that also I needed and changed me for, for who I am today. And that was a, a, a wonderful boys' home. And it, all it takes is one person. And, and my social worker at that boys' home um, changed my life. She, she gave me the emotional support that I needed and became that just one individual that it takes to help... Um, turn uh, a person's life around. And it did. I ended up staying there for three years by choice because I did not want to go back to my old neighborhood. I did not want to go to you know, my family. My mom got out of prison and was like selling drugs out of the house and things like that. So I just, you know, I, I had enough sense to really give myself an opportunity. 
Um, and I was cared for by this, by this place. Uh, you know, it's called, it was called Rancho San Antonio. It's in the San Fernando Valley. And I'm still, I'm still friend. Well, she's like my surrogate mother, this social worker of mine. Um, she no longer lives in California, but she's a big part of my life and has been ever since I, I was a kid there. Um, and I think that's really like, because I'm probably a little over time, I think, but, but I saw end right now. Thanks for my two-minute warning. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> I, was, I was intrigued by what you were saying, right? Thank you, Rudy. Yes. But I think where we're getting a theme now is that what we're hearing from our colleagues is that it, it's relationships, yes? It's that relationship with their siblings. It's that relationship with their grandparent. It's that relationship with that social worker. Yes? And that's where Father Greg started us this morning. It's about relationships. Yes? So thank you. And in my culture, when someone passes away, we say, may their memory be a blessing, which means every time we think about them, something good happens for somebody somewhere. I think that's what's happening with your grandmother. OK. OK. Well, now we're going to leave the great state of Los Angeles, and we are going to travel up the road. We're going to San Francisco, yes? And San Francisco turned out a fine product. And this is our colleague, Nick. Nick, tell us your story. OK. Hello. OK, so I, there's probably three things you need to know about me. One is that I'm, a, I'm not a Dodgers fan. So you can hate me. You can leave right now. Uh, two, uh, my family lives for a really long time. They just live a, <laughs> for a very long time. We're talking 105 years old. Uh, and they have kids really early. They, they are all, I think there's a whole legacy of all the people in my family being born before the parent is 18. So I wasn't, I wasn't different. Um, and my great grandmother raised me. In fact, I have uh, interactions where my great grandmother raised me and I would go with her to do errands for my great-great-grandmother. So it was a very strange thing to see your great-grandmother see her mom, which is, you know, but, and so I had to think about this, you know, when, when doing this panel or coming here because this is all I know. So I was thinking, you know, how, how, am I, how do I weave into a theme of how does this work into my life? And I, I don't know if I've mentioned, and if you've actually read it, but I'm actually a gerontologist, so I very much like affected affected my life, where I actually study that for a living. And a young gerontologist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, so it's actually affected my life tremendously. In fact, it's my 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 passion and my life's work to to study uh, the aging process, not just older adults, but the aging process in general. Um, and uh, in fact, I'm a, I'm a professor at Loyola Marymount, and I'm a researcher at USC. And much of my work is focused on um, looking at the dynamics between uh, looking at dyads and families. So in my case, looking at grandparents and looking at grandchildren and watching that. And uh, how this has affected my life and my work, it's because I, I had a great experience with my with my great grandmother. I mean, it's all I know. Um, I, sometimes I'm reminded that I didn't have a traditional relationship with my mom or anyone else in my family when I'm around friends or hear someone else's story, because I think of my great grandmother as my mom. I mean, even my, uh, even to today, uh, my relationship with my mom is kind of like she's like a sibling, it, uh, you know. And it's it's very strange. And sometimes I'm reminded that I become and I was quite a parentified kid at a year at a very early age. I think. You know, just in terms of like, I, I have an ability to sort of like deal with her stress where she, my mom doesn't have a, a capacity to deal with my stress. And I, only till now in my adult life am I looking back and seeing some of the consequences, positive and negative, of, of being raised by, by an older uh, grandmother, you know, in her 80s and 90s. And, uh, you know, we had a lot of rewarding experiences that just shaped my life and who I am. I'm a little emotional too. <laughs> my grandmother passed away quite a bit ago, but you know, um, I hit so many uh, milestones that. <laughs> no way. <laughs> well, can you say a few words before we continue on, um, Nick? Can you talk a few words about what made you decide to go into that line of work, given your growing up experiences? What, what, what got you there rather than, say, child welfare? Can you take us there for a minute? Sure, actually, yeah. And I think when you go, when you're in high school, you don't say, I really want to be a gerontologist. 
<laughs> so obviously, it's a, you evolve into that. You know, when I was in my master's and in my PhD program, and I think I became obsessed with the fact that the scientific literature shows a negative side to caregiving. It's overwhelmingly the sort of like negative focus. What are, what are older adults losing in the process? Like they, they're taken off their trajectory from being in retirement or these other things. So we tend to focus on, on all the losses and the negative aspects. And from my own experience, I just felt like there's such a rewarding aspect. There's this whole idea of generativity, of giving back. And it was such a part of my experience that I just felt like there's just a, a story that's, being not, that's not being told. There's just a, a rewarding spirit. And, fi and when you actually look at it, when you go outside the context of US, it's actually, it precedes like uh, recent modern times. I'm, I'm turning into that lecture <laughs> professor right now, sorry. Um, where most of the world's traditions had contact with grandkids and their grandparents. And so I think this, this obsession with like telling the sort of positive side of that dyad really has gotten me into that. And okay. Sorry, that answers your question. That does answer the question. So we're going to come back around and ask the three of you to talk with each other a little bit. You, you've heard each other's stories, how you've grown up um, within these systems, what has inspired you. So as you hear our colleagues speak, what struck you um, in their stories? Um, anything, your comment and your perspective that struck you from either of them and how they've managed to forge on? And then I'm going to ask you the same. So any of you, do you want to start or any of you? Right. Go ahead. Yeah, okay, go ahead. I have a question for you. Yeah. <laughs> So you talked a little bit about your experience in the system. Um, I would, I'm curious to know, since I talked about how I, I avoided that, um, can you share a little bit more about maybe some of the, the strengths and weaknesses of, you, of that experience for you and your sister? Um, well, I know one of the things that uh, more so to know um, that we had a large family um, of our, our biological family. And so to know that we were growing up in foster care with this large family um, and they would uh, pick us up for holidays and reunions or different little events that took place, but then they would bring us right back to the foster home. So for a long time, I, that really it wouldn't register to me. I didn't understand how that worked. And so now, you know, I know one of my aunts, she did make an attempt to, to, to get us. So as you talk about your kinship and you talk about your family and how your family really fought or, or worked or, or, or raised you, um, you know, that is very important. And, and, and when I look at now that we have the ASFA and kinship, to really support the relatives, um, I think that that's a strength that I take from that, from my background, knowing that there is family out there who can possibly, you know, if they're willing to go through the process to to raise the children. So, uh, and as far as a weakness of the um, not getting to know my biological family, I know. Uh, sometimes that uh, I have now taken the time to try to get to know my biological family. Um, I'm still connected with my foster family, um, and I've created as a foster child. I, sometimes you try to replace or do, and I have so many, which is my family, friends, and, and uh, people that I've known along this journey who are now considered my sisters, my aunts, my grandmother so you know sometimes someone will say well what grandmother is that you know so I have like three grandmothers that I may be uh, talking about so in that I've learned to develop my own kinship my own support my own circle in that um, is one of the strengths that I take from from being a foster youth Okay, because as you all were talking, one of the, in addition to the concept of relationships, one of the ideas is how you define family and how you, um, and how you create kinship networks. And we know that maybe in other times when people didn't move around so much, when we stayed in one place, we could build those. But we're so mobile now, it's hard to keep those. But when you think about 
Um, what are some, and all, I want all of you to think too, what are some of the ways that we could build kinship networks for people, not just the immediate like sisters and brothers, but I'm, I'm wondering are there other things that we could do to expand those networks so that like if I were in trouble and I needed help, I would want you to find everybody in the world who knows Eileen and say, come and, and, and let's see what we can do. Get with Eileen and let's see if we can help her. So any suggestions that you have about how we as social workers or mental health people can can get out there and expand networks so that we can find other people to step up. You know, when not just defining family as a mom and a dad and a couple of siblings, but whoever goes for kid. Any suggestions on that? What can we do? I would just say um, taking the time to to do that investigation, taking the time to speak with the children. Speak, once you start, you know, one person may say, well, my Aunt Sarah, even though my Aunt Sarah really isn't my aunt, but once you contact Aunt Sarah, Aunt Sarah knows probably five other of my mother's friends or, you know, it just grows. So if we just take the time to gather that information and follow up on it, or even sometimes if even when we first get the information, maybe in a year or a month or two, even though those leads didn't get us there and the first time, try them again, and then that time they'll say, wow, they're still in the system? Well, oh, you know what? And you know, so you can begin just by taking some time. Uh, I, 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 along with that, I would say the first thing that comes to my mind is, is why we're even here, is to know that it starts with a belief or a thought for any, any person, a social worker or a mental health worker, anyone that's, that's working with somebody in this you know, arduous task is to, is to remember a thought that it matters, that, that doing this work really matters, that if you find someone, that that, that process should never end and your, your belief in, in the work that you do matters. Like for example, I think that's why we're here, to, to really emphasize that that it does make a difference, you know, it makes a difference to have people in, in, in your life and to have an impact um, with, with somebody that cares and loves you. Um, so I would say it starts there, it starts with the thought. That, I think that's what informs my, my work is I don't, I always come from a place of, of my work matters and what I do really makes a difference. Um, so that's what I would add to that. You want to add to that before I ask another question? Okay. Okay. Okay, ask another question? Okay. So when we think about, um, sometimes we look at children's relationships with people who are going to raise them in terms of who has the legal right to the child. You know, and certainly the judge is going to look at that, who has the legal right. And I was thinking that in our, if, if you and I were to say we're kin, and you would look at us and say, well, you're obviously not kin by blood, you know, maybe not even by marriage, but if we say we are, we are. So the idea is not only who the judge says claims the child, but who do the children claim? And who do they want? And if we were to fast forward the clock, going 10, 20 years from now, and meet those kids and say, do we might make the right decision? I want that child to say, why, yes, you did. Why, yes, you did. We want people on the healing side, not the hurting side of these children. But that takes me to men. And that takes me to fathers and to dads. And I'm delighted to see a panel where we have um, some men here. And sometimes I think that dads, and we all know that the dads get left out of the equation. There's certainly a lot of research that shows that, that uh, we don't engage them to the extent that we should. And um, none of us got here, I don't think, by the Immaculate Conception. We all had a dad. So what can we do to engage fathers? I mean, you're a dad, and you talked about you know, how important that role modeling is for you. So what, what are your suggestions about engaging dads? And did you see anybody doing that to try to find the dads in your families? And any advice you have, and then we're going to talk to, the, to our colleagues. Yeah, I mean, in my situation, I mean, my, my father was largely sort of out of the picture. And, you know, I, I kind of follow some of the, what has happened because of that. And I ended up joining, like, the Marine Corps for four years. And I think I was really in search of, sort of sort of an identity of masculinity and some sort of role model and it's debatable whether I found it in the Marine Corps or not. <laughs> but uh but but it was very apparent that, you know, my, my father was largely out of the picture and um so I'm still sort of in the process of that as a as an adult right now. Mm. That's a great question actually. I I really um uh, yeah, that, that, 
I mean, I think for me, my own experience right now is to he healing that same same. Uh, I'm trying to continuously try to figure out who I am as a as a man, as a father, especially now. Um, like I explained, ex ex shared a little bit about my experience with the healing the healing opportunity I had with my father. You know, it went from when I was 25 years old. I got my uh, wages garnished when I was working because they thought I was actually my father. That was a very interesting thing. So I, I, I had a moment of real resentment toward my father for that, and and I really needed him at that time. I was 25 years old, and I think that was a time where, I kind of, really was looking for who I was as a man. And then I'm 36 years old now, and my father has not met my child. Um, she's four years old. I've seen him a handful of times since, you know, in the last few years. But I got to see him, you know, maybe three months ago. And, you know, I, I shared, I got, to, I got to forgive him and tell him I for, forgave him. And for me, I, I think more dialogue needs to take place with, with, with men and to, to give them more of an opportunity. I think there's systems in place or structures in place that don't really allow men to, to be who they are in a way and, and as fathers. So I think you know, that's something that needs to grow, but I don't really have the solutions. If I was, I would be, you know, running okay, you some things. Oh. Yeah, let me add something to that. And I, I, I think that, you know, fathers, in my experience, they start coming into picture later on after adulthood. And I, and I wish there was something in place to help me with my relationship with my dad at an earlier age, because I, I think in my family it was all the women that raised me. And it was just kind of like, you know, that's a, that was the women's role to sort of raise the children. And so when I think of grandparents as parents now, I think, you know, you look at the, the literature, it's a grandmother problem, uh, you know, and they're burdened with sort of this, and it's almost by double. And so I just wish that, you know, there was things that could help sort of get men involved at a much earlier age, because I think once you foster those relationships as you're growing up, it's not as though like dad comes in the picture when you're 20 that you have those systems and that foundation and rapport that just isn't there. Thank you. Did you want to go ahead? As far as um, I don't know my father, um, I did find the father listed on my birth certificate and it turned out that he was not my father. However, I do feel that with fathers, we need to value fathers. Let them empower the father because sometimes it is so much easier to go with the mother. The mother is eager. She's there. She wants her kids back. Sometimes the father may not even know or he'll say, well, you know, the mom can get them or the mom can have them. But if we take that time to empower and show that father the value, get him connected to services that are also empowering um, the father begins to, to take that role and begins to want to be a part of his child's life. So sometimes I just feel like if, if we really come at the father at an angle of showing him his worth and where he really, his role is important in that child's life, I think that we can begin to win fathers over. Here lately, the push for fathers has begun to change. So therefore, with that, we can begin to get the fathers to get more involved. Right. Good. Okay. And I think we give that a round of applause, I think, on that one. Okay. That there's, um, and, and I'd like to just um, ask all of you here today, are there anything, just on that theme before we change themes a little bit, anything that you are doing from your role, from your agency, from your viewpoint, to engage parents, um, moms, dads, however they are defined, but let's just stay with the dads. Anything that any of you are doing right now that you are really working on this? Anybody want to step up? And introduce yourself. Good afternoon. Three and a half, <clears throat> three and a half years ago, when I started working at the uh, dependency court, one of the first clients came to my office was a father. He came to me and he said, my daughter, who I raised after her mother deserted us, cussed me out, called me all kind of names, and I spanked her butt. 
And with me spanking her butt, the police came to the house and locked me up and charged me with abuse. So he's, his question to me was, do you have a program here or someone that can help me? As I looked around and searched, we didn't have anything to help this man. But thanks to Judge Nash's commitment to Hersha Swinger, right. a program came into the court called Project Fatherhood. Right. But the problem is, when fathers do step up, the court system seemed to make it so hard for them, it discouraged them from wanting to go all the way. Some fathers don't know that they're the fathers of the child that's in the court system. I had a young man come all the way from San Francisco after the baby's grandmother called him and told him he was the father of the baby. He comes to California, down, I mean to uh, Monterey Park, and they tell him he has to take a class, and maybe six months down the road, we'll consider giving you your child. So things like that happens quite often, more than it should, and it's constantly discouraging fathers from being a part of their kid's life. Thank you for doing a shout out to Dr. Swinger, the late Dr. Swinger and, and Project Fatherhood at CI, at Children's Institute, which is a remarkable program that always starts with, so how are your kids today? That's the question they start with, how are your kids today? So thank you for that. And you didn't tell everybody who you are. Did you all hear that? Grandparents is parents. I'm the community court navigator yes. at Edmonds Children's Court. Okay. Thank you for starting us off. Yes. Okay. Thank you, sir. For those of you who weren't in um, the workshop this morning with the Homeboy speaker, Homeboy Industries speaker, he was speaking about having parenting curriculum and fatherhood curriculum at Homeboys that they're trying to get gang-involved youth to be able to be good parents and catching them at that point as well. So that would be another resource people might want to look into. And we'd like to also suggest that any of you, whichever groups you're working with, you might think about always having a workshop for dads. So for example, at the Foster Parent Association Conference, they did a workshop just for foster dads. And maybe we want to think about something for grandfathers. And however, however we come to it, we always, maybe for next year, that's something that we can think about and do and keep going on. I'm going to come back to our panel here and ask you. You, you said that you're, one of the greatest gifts that your grandmother gave you was getting you arrested, right, when you were a, a teenager. And you went off to that residential place and there was a social worker there, and she made the difference in your life. Um, so you told that story. What about for you? Who, where was the turning point? You could, have, you could have gone another way, but you chose to be a loss manager. What was the turning point that, for you to make you decide to help others and reach out? I'm not for sure, um, because there were so many avenues, so many different events that I just felt that over time it was my goal to help kids in my situation. So I think for me it was a, a daily process of, I think I, it was just a drive for me because I felt like I grew up in foster care so my goal was to make sure my children didn't grow up in foster care. Um, my next drive was to push myself to go to college. So I think my, for me, it was just the whole drive of not to have, to break the cycle. Somewhere in there, I decided that I wanted to break the cycle and it became an everyday part of who I, who, it was like my being of what I wanted to do. And even if it was just me as this one individual that was breaking the cycle for my family um, to encourage maybe some friends who also grew up in foster care and now even to be a foster youth in graduate school um, I went to a training 
a couple of weeks ago and I found out that only 2% of foster youth attend graduate school. So now when I get a little discouraged, I say, you're not doing this for you, you're doing this for other foster youth because you now have to break that cycle because you have to let them know that you can too become a graduate student or, or a professional with a graduate degree. So I think for me, every day as I went through foster care, it was my drive, it was my first thought process of what, how can I change, what can I do differently because I've learned parents are people first and people of course make a mistake so how can I make sure that I'm pushing myself and, and not making sure that this is not generational. So for me it was just a, it was just an everyday drive. Okay, thank you. Gentlemen? Um, I think that when I think about like the turning point or I don't know if there was ever actually a, a major turning point when I was a kid. I mean, I think the bar was set really low in my family. Like my, uh, I mean, I'm the first person in my family to graduate high school. And so I don't think my family expected, there were no expectations. I, I'm an only child, so I didn't have any sort of social comparison. And my great grandmother is from Mexico and literally had walked over here over a year and a half in labor camps at the turn of the century. So, I mean, it was just, it was, education wasn't even talked about. It was such an edu educationally barren household. Um, and so naturally, I don't think I was really equipped to, to do well after high school. So I think the turning point was probably when I became a wartime Marine <laughs> and I didn't want to have that be my life. And I had friends who became like brothers to me, and um, they'd come from educational families, and they literally, I remember a couple of them took me, we're going to take you to junior college, we're going to show you what it is. And they literally took me over there. I just, it was not even on my radar. Like, I just never thought about it. And then uh, later, you know, I came in contact with a, a godfather who was a family friend, and he was a retired professor, and he became a mentor to me. Um, but just get getting more in that direction I think it was just probably sadly my military experience because I just I've seen so many bad things that I didn't want to be a part of or have that happen to me and when I came back I was just kind of lost I was like ground zero and so I didn't contend with any sort of like family that were like you're not doing a good job or you're not doing a bad job it was just let's figure this out everyone who is contributing and, and providing service to our country, of course, we're, we're grateful for everyone who is, who is doing that. And as we think of wars out there, there's also wars in this country, too. You know, many wars against children, crummy schools, you know, dangerous neighborhoods, poverty, you know, lack of affordable child care, and all of those things are still things that we're trying to do to make, to make it a safe place and not a war on children here. But we have this amazing opportunity with a room full of of kindred spirits. Would any of you like to say a few words about what you're doing in your agency and your role and your perspective to support kinship families so that we could network a little bit with each other? And then we're going to ask you a question about a very famous Dorothy and a story about a famous Dorothy who grew up in kinship care. So we're going to get to that at the end. Would anybody like to talk about what you're doing and, and highlight, um, share? Come on, guys, don't be shy. Yeah, what are you doing? Um, I'm Deborah Franks. I work part-time for Olive Crest Foster Agency. And the reason I work part-time is I have a full-time job, but I am a relative caregiver. And I, the way I was able to give back to the community was to go there and volunteer. And when they found out I was raising three children, um, they asked if I they could leave of my services. <laughs> so I work part-time for them and I took the day off work, my real job, just to, to be here. But one thing I really felt was important is you asked how do you build those kinship relationships with people that aren't kin. When I went through the process, they didn't have grandparents as parents. They had none of these organizations. And that's Part of what grandparents as parents is all about is their support groups. So that would be my number one place to recommend you build your kinship relationships through grandparents as parents. 
because in my in our generational family i have two more children in foster care in my family now that after i've raised three i'm not capable of taking them but i'm in turn needing my support group again because i'm dealing with that so i thought that that was a really important issue to give a shout out to them and their support group and what they have set in place because that's where your kinship begins with another family like-minded going through the same place that's where you stop start swapping fingerprints you take mine I'll take yours I'll be there for you you be there for me County of San Diego. And so what we have through our aging and independent services, we have our uh, grandparents raising grandchildren conference. We just had it on Grandparents Day in September. Um, and what it is is we had um, just grandparents coming from a lot of different organizations, from some um, kinship care organizations in San Diego. We had guest speakers talk about um, legal issues. Um, we had child care on board. Um, we had a number of speakers um, talk about, let's see, um, some, some of the financial issues that a lot of grandparents are dealing with. And so they were able to not only get um, some information from our panelists and from our speakers during the day, but also meet others so they can kind of meet each other and have that network that they needed. Um, so we're always looking for more speakers for our next event. But that's one of the things that we do in San Diego that we hope to continue. Since you mentioned San Diego, then I will represent us today. I'm Abby Brack from Child Welfare Services in San Diego. Um, East County specifically, one of the things we're doing is we have neighborhoods for kids. Since 2005, um, every single child that comes into custody, we immediately look for a relative or a non-related extended family member. Um, our goal is to keep them in their same school, their same community, and with their kin. So we have a family finder specifically in our office that takes every single removal or potential removal immediately and starts digging, digging, digging. We also have a father engager in our office who specializes in that so we can dig that way because we always forget to look at the paternal relatives as well. So we do that. And um, we're keeping our relative and non-related extended family member placements at about 79% for the past five years. Okay, over here, okay, and then we'll go over here, okay. Hello, my name is Sarah Dokes, and I'm the program director with Grandparents as Parents, and we are just so delighted that so many of you have chosen to be part of this conference, but I wanted to stand and just let you know that we are celebrating our, I think, 27th year, and I'm sitting next to our founder here, Sylvie D. Toledo. Stand up, Sylvie. <laughs> She's one of those magnificent founders that stays in the background. You know how some organizations, they'll say, the founder is coming, the founder is coming, and throw out little red rose petals all over the floor. But she's right there working right with everyone else. As a matter of fact, uh, we're, we're a lateral colleague. I'm the program director, and she is the clinical director. But we provide support services to grandparents and other relatives. We are now about to start with our 22nd support group that will be opening this Thursday in Duarte. But we have this unique opportunity to meet the needs of grandparents where they actually are. Usually when our grandparents come to us, as I'm sure that our panelists can, uh, can agree to, is that they actually many times lose their support systems, um, their sort of moved away from the general population of their families uh, many times. They have all these great plans of what they were going to do when they retired, and instead they find themselves raising children. And oftentimes, I think it was mentioned earlier what happened with the fathers, but sometimes with the grandfathers and uh, some of the experiences that I had is really challenging for them because they've had all these plans of, of sharing a life together with their wives and then suddenly they're taking on these grandchildren and it sometimes can cause a big rift in their families but at least coming to grandparents as parents they have a place where they can come and share their feelings 
share their joys, share some of their frustrations in an environment where it is welcomed, in an environment where it is understood. And an example that we often give is even when a grandparent comes to a support group and says she's just had it and she just feels like killing her grandchild. She is so frustrated. Well, we know in a different situation that could be interpreted as a grandparent really being at her breaking point and maybe having some mental health issues. If grandparents as parents, we just ask her to rephrase that. To, if she can change the wording on that and repeat it to us because we know that she's frustrated and they need to have a place where they can bring that frustration and share it across the table where it is completely understood. And there are very few agencies that welcome grandparents this, and give them this opportunity. And very quickly, I should say that all of our services for grandparents are free. And we go to their schools, we go to I T TDMs, we go to IEP meetings, we go to medical meetings, we uh, do home visits, we do whatever it is the grandparent needs, and we don't give it a second thought. And the other very unique thing about grandparents as parents that we would love to see other agencies uh, emulate is that we make ourselves available to our grandparents beyond five o'clock. So they're not going to get some sort of uh, automated system, but they're going to actually be forwarded to a live person who will help them sort out issues because their problems don't stop at five o'clock. And so that makes our program very unique. Everyone is touchable. Everyone has a phone number where they can be reached and everyone has a story that is very important to each other. So please uh, take advantage of the services that we provide. Um, we have materials in your notebook, in your beautiful um, bags. Uh, so be sure to read those materials and be able to refer families to us. We would love to have them. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lil. And I always pause between my last name because it's Sass. <laughs> That's really my name. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the community colleges. I'm with Citrus College, and we have the Foster Kinship Care Education Program throughout the state of California. And we provide classes to foster and kinship relatives. And we're always trying to come up with good ideas for curriculum. And our classes are free. And uh, if you're interested, you can really pretty much contact any community college or myself. If you want my number, uh, just see me, and we'll be happy to let you know what websites you can go to to see the numerous classes that we have available. Thank you. So where Kinship Care got its name, in, uh, about 25 years ago, in the early 90s, the Child Welfare League of America had a commission to take a look at how to improve foster care, family foster care, but recognized there was a whole other population of families out there that weren't foster parents. And we didn't have a name for it at that time. Nobody knew what to call it. And at that time, I remember in graduate school reading a book called All Our Kin, Strategies for Survival in a Black Community, written by Carol Stack, an anthropologist at Berkeley. And when we brought that book into the commission, into the Child Welfare League, we said, Kinship Care, the Strength of Kinship Networks. And Child Welfare League started calling it in 1991, Kinship Care, and when they did, everybody followed suit. So it's based on the work of Carol Stack, All Our Kin, Strategies for Survival in a Black Community. So you might want to know that. The other thing I wanted to ask you about is another word change. And every time you hear the word home, I want you to reframe it as family. It is not the home. See, home is another four-letter word. It is not the home that heals or hurts the children. It's the people living there that do. So think of family, family, family. Families have feelings, not homes. But to that extent, does anybody remember or, or know about or think of a very famous person named Dorothy, a fictitious Dorothy? Who's a famous Dorothy that you know, fictitious? Wizard of Oz. So did you know that the Wizard of Oz is a kinship care story? Did you know that? Well, it is. So Dorothy lived not with her parents, but who did Dorothy live with? Auntie M and uncle, see the men get left out. Who was the uncle? Henry, yes. And nobody's ever figured out why Dorothy was not with her parents. Anybody know that? Never, never thought about it. But Dorothy lived with her auntie and her uncle. And as you know, 
a crisis befell that family, and they became separated. Is that right? And where did Dorothy end up? Oh, no, no. Before she went to Oz, she went to an emergency shelter known as Munchkinland. And actually, it was a cross-cultural experience because the Munchkins did look quite a bit different than she did. Is that right? <laughs> different ethnicity, different, different voice, different language, different customs, different clothing. Yes. What did Dorothy want more than anything? Well, yes, she had that four-letter word in there. She wanted to go home. Of course, she wanted to get back to her family. Now, to do that, who did she have to go see? The wizard. Yes, the judge. Yes, that's true. And where was Oz? That's the courthouse. So that's where she had to go. And what did she have to travel to get there? The yellow brick road? Oh, so much paperwork. There was just so much paperwork that she had to travel in order to get there. Now, along the way, she met a whole bunch of folk, right? She met, let's see, the Tin Man, Cowardly Lion, Scarecrow. What did they want? A heart, brains, and courage. Yeah, she met a bunch of workers. Okay, so she met them. And she also met the good witch and the bad witch. Is that right? Okay, so what's the bad witch? The bad witch is a, a system, a community, that doesn't take care of its people. That's a bad witch system. And a good witch system, those are communities that do that do look out and that do take care. But in the end, Dorothy was able to get back to her family. Why? Because her friends, who thought they didn't have courage, thought they didn't have brains, and thought they didn't have a heart, you know, they had it all along, right? And so do all of us. And so we just have to remember to use our brains and use our courage and use our love for the kids and the families. And that's what it's all about. So please join me in thanking our panel. Yes, thank you. And thanking Madeline and Sylvie and the whole GAP team for having us here today. We're very grateful. Thank you all, and be safe.